When it was first announced that Dr. Robert Gallo had found the virus that probably caused AIDS, and that announcement was made with Margaret Heckler in 1984 to the press and to the media without one single scientific document appearing in any journal in the United States. And as we know now, without any proof whatsoever that the virus caused any disease. The media picked up on it for the sake of a story. And soon the virus that probably caused AIDS was now the virus that caused AIDS. It was proven in the press and nowhere else. Now I have offered for over a year now, and I continue to offer it, $100,000 to anyone who will give me one scientific document that proves that HIV causes any serious disease. It doesn't. It is a scandal and a scam beyond belief. The virologists who are responsible for this, what do they have to gain? Now, I don't know what Dewsbury had to gain or Charles A. Thomas or Carrie Mullis. He already got his Nobel Prize. Why does he come out and say it? And he's the one that found the test, the uh, PCR reaction. And he said that there is no body of evidence that supports that the virus causes any disease whatsoever. But what about the individuals who have perpetrated this lie? They are all multi-millionaires. What do we have to say about the National Institutes of Health when a private laboratory, independent laboratory, found AZT to be 1,000 times more toxic than the laboratory of the NIH? We can understand a 5% error in a laboratory, even a 10% error. But a 10,000% error? Or 100,000% error? That's fraud. And as I understand it, the word has gone out, and there's even documents and letters to prove it, that the CDC, the same organization that let blacks go untreated with syphilis, well documented, just to see what would happen with the disease. This same organization who had to admit that they can't give, on an, give in on the AIDS thing now because nobody would ever be able to trust the government. I think the last election tells us what the people think about government. But science is acting no differently than politicians do. And now we have disease by politics. 30,000 Russians who tested positive for HIV were then tested with another test that's supposedly far more accurate to confirm the positivity. And 66 out of 30,000 proved to be positive. That means that the test HIV is 99.997% inaccurate. You want to take a test that's 3 thousandths of a percent right? And you're going to rely on that? But that's what they're doing to people out there. They're taking a test that is not only invalid, it's totally misleading. In fact, when you get results like that, then I would say you're going to be more correct that if you're read as being negative, consider yourself positive. And if you're positive, consider yourself negative. And by the way, at the request of many individuals, I did go for a test a couple of weeks ago in New York City at the biggest clinic there that does more testing than anybody else. And the doctor who ran it was bragging about the fact that he did more. When I told him about the book I wrote, he said, shh, don't say anything. My patients might hear. Okay. I tested negative. And of course, Fauci said that you need, or when he was answering what I did in uh, Cleveland a week ago, he said, well, he's going to have to stick himself 300 times to transmit the virus. Where are you people in the press? 300 times to transmit a virus? You cannot have an epidemic under those circumstances. <laughs> if you can't transmit it by blood, you certainly can't transmit it sexually, unless you're into real sadistic acts during sex. I don't know how much blood you want to draw. <laughs> He gives you the answer to the test in 15 minutes. So it's quite a racket. And by the way, it's very interesting because that you asked the question. Because you see, I was in 
a quandary as to what possible purpose could this serve. If you have a test that's 99.997% inaccurate, what are you proving? You would treat somebody with a deadly drug on the basis of a test that's totally worthless. And by the way, let me point out that a research group in Australia in the past year have stated that not only is the test completely inaccurate, it's totally nonspecific. That you could be positive if you had the measles, if you had the flu, if you had a flu shot from your doctor or if you had any one of a hundred diseases, let's look at the scenario. This is serious business. Yeah. Somebody gets the flu or gets a flu shot this year. But so what you're finally suggesting is that the man that you, you this prominent physician uh, in Greenwich Village, uh, he in fact said, don't tell anybody about this because I'm making money off of these tests. Are you, are you finally saying to people don't get tested? I am saying absolutely do not get tested. Would you advise anybody to take a test that's 99.997% wrong? And you're saying that that's insanity. And by the way, when I said to this physician, when he asked me why I was there, and I told him I was a doctor, I said, because I'm in a heavy risk group. He said, aren't we all? And laughed about it. Because everybody knows that the medical profession sticks itself all the time. And the only individuals who are going to die of AIDS who are part of the medical profession in any way, sh shape, or form are those who are taking AZT or other drugs. A drug that was discovered in the 60s as a chemotherapeutic drug for cancer and was shelved because it was too toxic to treat cancer. A drug worse than cancer is being to used to treat people who are immunosuppressed. But did anybody here bother to look at the insert, the paper that comes with the drug? It's a DNA terminator. It means it is a terminator, just like the movie. It terminates life. You terminate DNA, you terminate life. And they talk about side effects in the insert. When are you going to learn there is no such thing as a side effect in medicine? It's an unwanted direct effect. And you know what one of the unwanted direct effects of AZT is? Lymphoma, cancer, one of the diseases of AIDS, as they call it. Oh, another so-called side effect, which is really an unwanted direct effect, pancytopenia. You need a definition? Pancytopenia, pan, all, cyto, cells, penia, loss of loss of all your cells. That's AIDS. That is the definition of AIDS. So AZT, by definition, by their own drug insert, causes AIDS, and nobody survives AZT. That will eventually lead to your death. And they've cut the dosage way down because it was killing them too fast. It's like giving somebody a large dose of strychnine and they die within five minutes. And so the next person, you give them a, a, a few drops of it, and they last four or five days, and you say, strychnine's a wonderful drug. This person lasts five times longer. This is the kind of thing that they present to the world. Go ahead. Um, you said that AIDS is not an epidemic, it's an endemic um, circumstance caused by a variety of factors, including malnutrition and drug use. How, then, can you explain the years of potential life loss in the 250,000-plus people who have died of AIDS according to CDC definition where drug use has been going on for centuries and suddenly we're losing people in their 20s and 30s because I'm not sure what you're... Okay, that's an excellent question, really. And you're using your head. That's the kind of question you should have been asked of Gallo at the very beginning. And by the way, you said 20s and 30s are healthiest people. Isn't it strange? You got a disease, the first disease in the history of mankind that affects our healthiest. But what happened in the 60s? The drug culture began. What happened in the 70s? It heated up. 
At the end of the 70s, the gays came out of the closet and became an identifiable group. Now, I'll ask you, in a sense of redundant question, but yeah, I think it'll get the point across. I'm going to name five of 30 diseases. Tuberculosis, a new disease. Lymphoma, oh, that's a new disease too. Leukemia, oh yes, that's a very new disease too. Pneumocystis pneumonia, another new disease, but lesser known. And Kaposi sarcoma, another new disease. No, these diseases and the other 25 have always been around. It's real easy, it's real simple to create an epidemic. You simply take a bunch of diseases and put them under one heading and then claim that one virus is responsible for it. Well, that's nonsense. And now they're caught up in a maelstrom. Now if the truth gets out, yes, it will deal a blow to the credibility of the NIH and the CDC yeah. and the FDA and the AMA and my God, it is sorely needed. Yeah. That blow is necessary to clean up the act. Spirit and mind are wonderful things. What you're saying is true. It's a sentence of death for most people. And immediately, their body metabolism goes into negative phases. Everything becomes destructive. This is modern medical voodoo. If a doctor tells you, you are going to die, I'm willing to bet you're going to die. I'll be the first one to put money on the line and say, the chances are you're going to beat the statistics. You will die because you've been told so. This is American voodoo. You know that you can change the T-cell count if you worry somebody? Completely established. I worry about these individuals who go in and get these T-cell counts one after another because their whole life is focused on these T-cell counts. And when it goes down a little bit, instead of being reassured, which is the way I would interpret it, they get panicky. Now they're really doing damage. And at some point, if they're on drugs, and sometimes even if they're not on anything, but because they've been told they're going to die, like the witch doctors of Africa and elsewhere, these individuals will die because they literally worry themselves to death. It's a crime beyond belief. They're the rare ones, I admit. But the fact is, T-cell counts absolutely have no correlation with severity of disease. They can be low because you have wiped out your immune system, and they can be low because you don't need them. That's the important thing to understand. It is not a barometer for anything. And they lie, they lie, they lie, and then they lie some more. Well, HIV led the bandwagon where you can basically uh, invent something out of thin air and turn it into a multi-billion dollar, uh, hundreds of billion dollars industry. Another example would be the uh, hepatitis C, which is even acknowledged by Chiron, which used to exist, the company that made the original hepatitis C test, that they never ever actually obtained hepatitis C. They just got bits and pieces of it and then inferred what this virus must be. And people to this day are being tested for something that has never ever been obtained from a human being. Now is there an association between people who are HIV positive and tend to get AIDS? That's exactly the situation you're saying about HIV and AIDS. That's right. They generate it over time and that's how they defeat, defeat the viral infection. But it's even worse than that. The inserts that come with the antibody test for HIV ex uh, say explicitly in there that they have no reference standard to determine whether or not the antibodies that, that they detect positive in the test actually have anything to do with HIV. They don't even know if those antibodies are really from HIV because they have no reference standard. Well, how did we ever get to a situation then? This is not making any sense. How could a logical physician or uh, the whole medical profession come to the conclusions based on no evidence? Or is that probably a question you want to ask me? I don't well, know. Well, I mean, I've asked myself that, too, uh -huh. because when I was a young scientist in my early 30s, back in 1980, when this whole AIDS thing uh, uh, popped up, yeah. uh, I was eager to get on to it, work on it, like every other scientist that I knew. It was such a bizarre thing. You know, it was a, all these weird diseases I'd never heard of in my life were, were occurring, popping up exclusively in gay men. I mean, that, that's strange. I thought it was my Andromeda strain, you know, <laughs> at the time, and I wanted to work on it. But uh, I learned uh, years later that the Centers for Disease Control had actually accurately figured out what AIDS was as early as 1982. 
they had discovered that it was a drug disease, that the, the, the reason that these AIDS diseases, these immune deficiency diseases and other diseases, were the uh, uh, direct result of chronic use of recreational drugs, amphetamines, uh, poppers, uh, uh, heroin, cocaine, and things like that. Okay. How that changed was by decree at a press conference on April 23rd. By decree? By decree. <laughs> at an, uh, There's a scientific approach. I, the king, now say it's this way, so therefore it is? Yes. Is that what I, you're saying? I remember it very distinctly because, remember, I was a scientist eager to know. I'd spent about four years wondering how I could apply my talents as a scientist to work on AIDS. But nobody really understood in the, in the scientific world what was causing AIDS. And then on April 23rd, 1984, Margaret Heckler, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, brought out uh, Robert Gallo of the National Cancer uh, Institute and uh, cl uh, said that he had discovered the probable cause of AIDS. The very next day, they deleted the word probable. Uh, uh, and Robert, it became a fact. It became a fact. Robert Gallo applied for a patent on his HIV test that very day. Ah. The federal government got behind it. Now the federal government, we taxpayers, as of this year, because of the latest legislation for the PEPFAR program, which had just uh, uh, voted in another $48 billion for African AIDS, we have now spent to uh, a quarter of a trillion dollars, $250 billion on AIDS. American taxpayers have just, not the drug companies, not volunteer organizations, but the federal government has, has spent this money. The probable cause of AIDS has been found. And she introduced the scientist who led the team, Dr. Robert Gallo. When Gallo's group examined the blood of people... Wow. And they have not saved the first AIDS patient. They use that fact to advertise more money to do AIDS research and to warn people about uh, uh, safe sex and condoms and things. Before you go on with this, mm -hmm. I want to just substantiate what Dr. Rasnick is saying. He's saying that the literature that we have, the medical literature, the scientific literature, is no longer believable. And it's not just him saying it. Marcia Angel, who was a physician and chief editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, Catherine DeAngelis of the Journal of the American Medical Association, Ushma Anil of another major medical journal, have all quit their jobs and said they, they are disappointed, disillusioned, and can't believe the low quality of material that's coming across their desk that's published in their journals. And it's because of other factors. There are people who have an ax to grind, who have a mission to accomplish, who have an ulterior motive to be able to uh, get their point across. So if a pharmaceutical company, for example, is doing a study, they're going to make it look the best they can. They're not going to invest half a billion dollars, okay, in a, in a study and come out and say, don't buy our drug, it sucks. So we're seeing a lot of that. So what you're saying is no more than a reflection of what they are saying. And you've personally experienced that. Yeah, and more and more uh, people are. The main, even, it is such an obvious problem now that many of the mainstream people are, are speaking out. Even the physicians are beginning to question. Yeah, and look at the direct-to-consumer ads and all the problems that yeah. come with that. The HIV kids. Yeah, okay, these right. are kids that are HIV positive. Right. They're healthy. Yeah. If the parent won't follow the advice of the doctor and give them the AZT drug, mm -hmm. Child Protective Services comes in and says, we're going to take the kid away from you. Yeah. What's... What do you think of that? Uh, it's horrible. I've, I've been involved in a number of these cases on the side of the parents trying to keep their kids from being taken away and being poisoned on these drugs. And I've known a number of cases over since the 90s that I've been personally involved in well, on a legal basis. It's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. These children and parents have absolutely no civil rights when it comes to health care. And that is an abomination. And I hope that these court cases, we, we need to put these things on trial. We need to take a lawsuit or make a lawsuits against uh, Glaxo Welcome, uh, Glaxo Smith Klein and these other places that are killing people with these drugs. Right. To public, basically, not, not so much that I want to hurt them, which I don't care about that though, one way or the other, but it's got to be publicized somehow and the best place to do it is in the courtroom. And that's where the data you can bring from the studies that have been done that are in the scientific literature that show all the things that you're talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Because they're a matter of public record. Absolutely. Now, it's easy to come by if you want, really want it. Okay, so now if somebody is HIV positive and uh, you want to do, if, if you're going to do anything for somebody that's like that, you would pro probably propose doing nothing. Yes. But yeah. if somebody comes to you that, and they have even acquired immune deficiency syndrome, they have AIDS, how would you propose treating them? You use lifestyle uh, things? You support them? I mean, I'm not, I tell you what, we I don't have, do. we only got about a minute or two left. Sorry, so sorry. I don't know how you're going to do that. I'm not a physician. 
But I, I know one thing. I would but not, you know a lot about I, this. I know a lot about this. I would not. I would treat symptoms. Mm -hmm. You know. I mean, if it's malnutrition, feed people. That's what yeah. we did in South Africa. It works like magic. It's right. amazing. They get better. Really, right before your eyes, almost. Uh, you don't treat them with toxic drugs. You don't. I would tell people. I, I'll even make it even more blunt. We need to outlaw the HIV test. We need to outlaw these tests. They do. They're horrible. They kill people. The tests kill people because then they go on and they take the drugs and the drugs ki kill the people. Nobody. I'd adv I would say nobody should take an HIV test. They should refuse every opportunity or any pressure to take an HIV test out there. Can anybody force you to take an HIV test? Uh, you can if you're in jail, for example, and yeah, they've tried to make, uh, I, in some states they force, they, it's on a state-by-state -state basis. And um, the, um, uh, anybody who's ever had an HIV test, totally forget about it. Erase it out of your mind if, you, if possible. Now, if you can't, then the, uh, the HIV test is so unstable that it, it, the result depends on what day you take it on, where you go, even, and who looks at it. It's totally arbitrary. So it might be negative one day and positive another. Exactly. So if you're positive and you really, really want a negative, just keep taking test after test until you get the negative, <laughs> and then use that, that result. So these drugs, then, that are using to treat immune deficiency are actually causing it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, they weren't actually designed to treat immune deficiency. They were designed to kill HIV. Okay, that's right. what I meant by that. Right. Okay. Assuming that HIV is destroying the, Im the immune system. However, uh, as you mentioned, AZT, DDI, 3TC, D4D, yeah, yeah. and all these other uh, nucleoside analogs were developed in the 1960s as chemotherapy for cancer, the chemotherapy for cancer. Mm -hmm. No physician would uh, prescribed cancer chemotherapy for the lifetime of the patient, they'd be taking up on charges for malpractice because the chemo will kill the patient if they stay on it for life. For the life. Right. But yet, if you're HIV positive, if you happen to have antibodies that react on the laboratory's test or whatever, and you're called HIV positive, the standard of care is now to give you these drugs for life. Wow. And these drugs can kill you. In fact, they do kill you. And since, I think, the late 1990s, the leading cause of death among HIV-positive Americans is liver failure. Right. Due caused to the, by the drug. Caused by these drugs. And now, since, again, the, about the, the mid-1990s, there's a new problem. The, the, the AIDS establishment is sweeping this under the rug, and they're giving it a new name. They're calling it IRS for <laughs> Immune Reconstitution Syndrome. That's or, as bad as IRS Internal yeah, Revenue Service. Yeah, that's, that's easy to remember. <laughs> that's and right. it's, these drugs are causing exactly the same AIDS-defining diseases that the CDC came up with in their clinical definition of AIDS. What makes them called I IRS or Immune Reconstitution Syndrome and not AIDS is because these diseases now only pop up after people start taking the antiretroviral drugs with, on weeks to months. Wow. They're exactly the same diseases as AIDS, so they're, instead of calling them drug-induced AIDS, they're called immune reconstitution syndrome. Well, that's sweet. That just avoids And it's a huge, huge literature on this now, and whole conferences are devoted to this problem. Now, this is interesting because maybe most of the doctors don't read the medical literature uh, and, and do mm -hmm. it seriously, mm -hmm. and, they, and they do kind of what everybody else in the profession recommends because those are the standards of practice in a community. But the pharmaceutical companies know this. Yes, they do. Because they make the information up. So does the, the NIH. CDC the must know it. They do. Okay, and yet they're, they're perpetuating this myth. Right. Anyway. Well, okay. You know why it has to continue? I think I do, but well, you say but it. But I'll <laughs> say it. All, all a person has to do is imagine, just imagine that what we are talking about here is true. Yeah. That AIDS is not contagious, it's not sexually transmitted, it's not caused by HIV. The, the anti-HIV drugs are killing people and causing AIDS-defining diseases. Wow. And, and on top of that, there's no such thing as an AIDS epidemic in Africa, and we can talk about that. That's, another, like subject, that's, yeah. an, that's another subject entirely. Now, if all of that is true, we spent a quarter of a trillion dollars on this bogus blunder, this biggest scientific medical mistake th of, of all time. The germ of lies, huh? The germ the of lies. The title of your book. Right. Then what is the likelihood that the directors of the National Cancer Institute, the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, Secretary of Health and Human Services, or any president of the United States is going to say, whoops, folks, sorry, we made a mistake. Yeah, right. What is the likelihood of that happening now? Well, I guess it's not too good because it hasn't. <laughs> the CDC, actually, when Peter Duisberg had his article back in 1987, in cancer research where he critiqued the whole thing about retroviruses in general, HIV in particular, and how they could not cause any disease. The CDC, Peter was able to lay his hands on an internal memo that was going around that said if this got out and the public knew about it, nobody would ever believe us again. Right. That's it. That's basically it. It's not even about money anymore, really. It's about face saving. It's about the whole 
uh, infrastructure or edifice of the health care system in the United States, possibly the whole institutional form of government, would, would be seriously undermined by the fact that this huge quarter trillion dollar mistake was allowed to happen and it's, and it's continuing to happen and the people in the government know it.